All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our final Chief Resident Grand Rounds. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Puya Joel Harzada, who will be giving our final talk. Uh, so just real quick about Puya. Um, he comes to us originally, studied at UC Irvine, uh, was going to be a musician, but then luckily medicine kind of snatched him away. He went to UPMC for medical school and then was here for residency and was one of our chiefs this year. Um, sharing the VA role, I think Puya and I worked the most closely together this year. Um, and so I know him to be a thoughtful, generous, intelligent individual and the CARDS program and just this institution are lucky to have him. Um, and I'm excited to hear his talk as well as kind of nervous about what he has to tell us about the climate's looming impacts on public health. But welcome Puya. Uh, thanks everybody, can you all hear me okay? All right, perfect. Um, thank you, Sonia. That was, uh, was very kind of you. Um, it's always a little bit nostalgic towards the end of anything. And so, you know, as this week comes to a close, you'll be seeing less of us, but uh, we will always be with you. I hit my mic. I'll try not to do that 45 times during the talk. Um, but yeah, uh, I had the same thoughts. You know, this is an exciting topic. Oh no, what is it gonna show? Um, first off, I gotta start with disclosures. I have absolutely none. Uh, maybe one day I will. Um, and just as a reminder, this is part two of a joint talk between Jonah Graves and I. So as a reminder, last week he presented at Grand Rounds and he really discussed how healthcare delivery in the greater health sector impacts uh, the climate in a negative way and ways to mitigate that. Um, and today I'll be talking about the inverse about how climate um, affects health. Uh, so how did I get started? Um, I like watching doomsday shows and movies a lot. And so when this show Extrapolations came out on Apple TV, I had to watch it. It's by Scott Burns. Um, it's an anthology about the effects of climate change. It kind of goes through the century and it tells us all the terrible bad things that are going to happen um, during uh, because of climate change. And one of the interesting things is that uh, there was something called Summer Heart, where it seems really poorly defined, but it seems to be some type of congenital heart disease that uh, is a result of smoke exposure from wildfires and pregnant mothers. And as you go through this century, this child grows up, is constantly hypoxic, has a shorter lifespan. And that kind of got me thinking about what kind of other health complications could happen. Um, and then the one thing that I really wanted to point out, and as I realized, is that climate change is already here, and so are its health consequences. And so I hope some of that I'll be able to highlight during the talk today. And uh, just as like I mentioned, the show started off strong, but maybe a nosedive a little. So wa watch at your own risk, but I still enjoyed it nonetheless. So a couple learning objectives. One, I'd like you to understand the direct and indirect impacts of climate change on health outcomes. Two, I want you to under I, I want you to know who the vulnerable populations are and what the climate gap is. And then finally, I want you to know about the initiatives that are going to mitigate some of these adverse health outcomes. The World Health Organization has estimated that about 250,000 additional deaths are going to happen every year between 2030 and 2050. And this is directly related to climate change healthcare impacts. Uh, most of it is because of malnutrition, heat stress, uh, diarrhea, and malaria or vector borne illnesses. Uh, and when you look at these factors, you can already start thinking about what sorts of things can impact it. Climate, access to care, food security, clean water, a lot of things that are called social and environmental determinants of health. And as is anything in healthcare, we got to put money to it. And this is going to cost us about 2 to $4 billion per year. And this is excluding other climate complications like agriculture. This is just purely the health cost. Um, there are some uh, estimates that about, you know, GDP is going to be reduced by $23 trillion in the next 50 years. So we'll have to keep a close eye on it. Um, the World Health Organization has put this graphic uh, that's a pretty nice summary of how we uh, try to wrap our heads around this. Um, and so they propose this model on understanding the complex relationship between climate change and health. It shows our pretty typical exposure pathways, our, our vulnerability pathways, and then our complications. So when we think about exposure pathways, these are the typical things we think about. Heat stress, 
extreme weather, air quality, water quality, flooding, things when you think about climate. Things like uh, vulnerability factors are things that will change risk of health outcomes from these exposures. And they're typical to a lot of other social determinants uh, uh, of health. And uh, uh, ultimately, um, it's really important to understand this population. And, and I'll show you a little bit later about why that's important. Um, and some of the climate sensitive health risks uh, and worst, uh, uh, worst healthcare outcomes are related to direct injury from weather events uh, like heat, um, drowning, respiratory illness, infection, and I'll, I'll go through those a little bit later. The sad and unfortunate truth to all this is that those who contribute the least to climate change are probably going to be the most affected. Um, and this is especially important in our lifetimes as we try to figure out our energy solutions. You know, multiple uh, organizations have placed efforts in identifying who these vulnerable populations are. And, uh, you know, if I get too hot, I don't have to work outside. I get to sit in an air conditioned room and other people don't have that luxury. And we'll see data showing why that's important as well. Um, the people who are gonna suffer the most are children, uh, elderly, low income uh, communities, indigenous communities and developing countries. So when you think nationally um, within the United States, climate change and fossil fuel generated air pollution have disproportionately harmed people of color in low income communities and low income and in low income communities. And so have our solutions to fix these things. Um, a couple of things to know, as an example, a lot of structural racist um, uh, housing policies like redlining have really shed light onto this issue. Um, these artificial structures have uh, created these sacrifice zones where we're, oh, uh, you know, in society okay with experiencing some of those bad health effects in these certain areas, whereas wealthier areas kind of benefit from some of the uh, uh, pollution and don't experience the same outcomes. Um, and that's ultimately uh, the socioeconomic differences is going to be um, uh, called the climate gap, where these differences uh, create differences, these differences in uh, vulnerability factors create differences in healthcare outcomes. So um, following the Great Depression, the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation can, uh, started redlining um, areas, and you may be familiar with it, but essentially they mapped neighborhoods and uh, gave loans uh, to certain areas and to certain people based on risk and real estate development. And this was like supposed to be an economic, you know, um, boom after the Great Depression. And, you know, it was very racist. It was targeting people of color. Um, and excluding them from neighborhoods. And when you look at these neighborhoods, uh, there are more impermeable surfaces, there's less tree canopy, and this leads to a heat island effect. And so when you look at the actual temperature of these um, heat islands uh, in the worst places, they're as uh, high as seven degrees centigrade higher than their counterparts. Um, it's actually worse in the Southeast and West and uh, not as bad in the Midwest, but even in the Midwest, they're two and a half degrees uh, higher than their counterparts. So, you know, you really have to look at your specific region because the Midwest is a very heterogeneous place, but um, it's these seemingly small changes in temperature can actually have very drastic uh, uh, health outcomes. Um, this is a nice illustration that the CDC put together that shows the different silos of climate related uh, illness. Um, much of these exposure pathways um, depend on geography. So for example, you know, you're gonna have different health outcomes if you're in a dry, hot area, it's a place that's prone to flooding. Um, but you're seeing here where severe weather is going to, you know, give you pretty immediate direct fatalities as well as chronic long-term um, complications from destroyed infrastructure, decreased access to health, you have air pollution, which I think is probably a little bit more familiar with us, especially today. Um, we have uh, changes in vector ed uh, ecology, so the uh, geographic expansion of certain things that like to bite us, and uh, aka mosquitoes. 
uh, uh, increasing allergens, uh, water quality impacts, food security, environmental degradation, and civil conflict. Um, I just read something in the news uh, about uh, a dam on the Nile being um, built right now. And basically every country downstream is incredibly worried about the downstream um, water effects it's gonna have on their population and then extreme heat. So I'm gonna go through several of these and um, they're going to be some very interesting findings. Some of the uh, statistics is a little bit complicated because you have to control for a lot of climate models, um, population data, and uh, there's certain terminology like lag days, which I'll throw around, but essentially a lag day is what your health outcome is after an exposure. So lag zero is exposure to like a flood and you get a health complication. Lag six is you, you got exposed to a flood on Monday and you have a complication on Sunday. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is um, extreme weather and that's heat. So um, the CDC put this uh, together, this awareness card uh, that describes some pretty common heat related illnesses that we already know of. Some complications like heat stroke, heat exhaustion, heat cramps, sunburn, heat rash. Uh, and it's nice because this is really based for the population to read about and, and learn about. Um, and, and what to do about it. Now, when we take out like extreme heat waves, even uh, temperature excluding extreme uh, 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 weather um, has uh, pretty bad health outcomes. So there's a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with it. And this is a meta-analysis that looked at 16 million elderly um, uh, cases and per one degree rise in temperature, we have a uh, almost three and a half percent increase in cardiovascular mortality. Uh, mortality due to ischemic heart disease increases by about 1.6%. Um, and it's interesting because mortality is uh, the increased risk peaks pretty much immediately after it's uh, uh, exposure. It's a little bit confusing because there isn't like a extreme weather event, but um, in their time analyses, they considered it pretty early on to an increased temperature exposure. And then morbidity uh, risk happens a little bit later. Um, respiratory mortality is a huge one too in heat um, with the uh, uh, increase in 3.6%. Cerebrovascular mortality is also increased, but uh, not by much. Interestingly, even in a drop in temperature and average temperatures, we'll see mortality changes. So, you know, it's like, well, now what? Um, Respiratory, it's, this is primarily driven by respiratory mortality. You get 2.9% increase. And this is really driven by pneumonia, probably infections. And I imagine, you know, when it's cold, you put your heater on, closing windows, not a lot of air circulation, increasing your risk of things like viral infections, et cetera. Cardiovascular mortality also increases, but not by much. And, you, you know, when, when you think about heat and why this affects the cardiovascular system so much, you just take it back to basic physiology. When you're hot, you sweat. That's your sympathetic tone, right? And so anytime you increase your sympathetic tone, you think about, you know, heart failure, and that's like very counterintuitive to anything you want in heart failure. Um, and so uh, you get increased workloads, and um, you also get increases in uh viscosity because your plasma volume is decreasing because you're dehydrated and that can increase thrombosis. You can get increased inflammatory cytokines. So like, why is this relevant to us? Well, just think about your patient, let's say a patient with heart failure. Um, it's actually an independent prognostic factor in um, heat related death. And that makes sense because in, in, when you're compensating for heat, it's a cardiovascular compensation mechanism, which people with heart failure don't really have. And all the meds we give them kind of counteract that. They block their ass system. They block be uh, uh, beta blockers. You know, you're giving them diuretics. So you have to be really mindful to patients who are on all these medications when Missouri is experiencing a heat wave. Maybe say, hey, if you're feeling lightheaded, dizzy, and it's like 100 degrees and humid, maybe don't take your Lasix um, for a day or two. But that's a very intimate uh, conversation you need to have with your patient. Now, this is just an example in Missouri in 1980. I wasn't around, but there was a heat wave. And uh, it, it, it unfortunately caused 120 heat-related deaths and a big agricultural in impact. So um, besides people, 200,000 uh, 200, chickens died, and then about half the state's corn 
uh, crop died. Um, and there's actually a nice study in JAMA that basically said uh, all-cause mortality increased by 54% in St. Louis and 64% in Kansas uh, City. And um, something I found a little bit later, which is from the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. I was a little bit skeptical by this title, but it's actually like a pretty credible source of a um, group of scientists. Uh, but they are predicting that there's going to be pretty significant increases in the number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Missouri. So this is here now. Um, between 1961 and 1990, there are less than three um, days per year over 100. And their prediction models, you know, puts that almost to 50 in 100 years. That's pretty bad. And can you imagine 50, 100 degree humid days? That's awful. And you can see how much impact that's going to have. So we can relate heat and the climate uh, gap together. This is a nice study that uh, looked at heat-related mortality in the United States based on occupation. Um, this is between 2000 and 2010. So sex differences, men have higher risk of uh, mortality compared to women. When we look at race and ethnicity, um, blacks were uh, higher risk of uh, mortality compared to whites. Ethnicity, Hispanics more so than non-Hispanics, and this was actually the largest difference we saw. And when we look at occupation, we're not really surprised that occupations with the highest rates of heat-related uh, uh, mortality uh, are people who work in agriculture and construction, who are uh, physically working outside in the sun, probably with no access to shade, water, things like that. And when stratifying by ethnicity within these uh, occupations, even people who work in agriculture, if you're Hispanic, you are uh, at a higher risk of mortality than if you're non-Hispanic. And this is the same with um, uh, construction. And this is really highlighting the importance of the climate gap that I talked about earlier. There are really important social and environmental determinants of health, um, even people in the same occupation that we need to pretty much figure out what to do. Um, one thing that I didn't know about was something called Mesoamerican nephropathy. So um, this is a potential disease related to heat exposure. Um, there are high rates of irreversible kidney disease in agricultural workers, primarily sugarcane workers um, in Mesoamerica. And this was in the absence of traditional risk factors like diabetes and hypertension. Um, this is attributed to exposure because of their work. Um, it's typically in men 20 to 50 years old. They usually work at least two seasons. Um, you know, the presentations vary widely, just like what you would think with CKD. There, sometimes it's insidious, sometimes it's an acute presentation, um, and their labs are pretty typical of other forms of CKD. They won't have nephrotic range proteinuria, and then on biopsies, they'll have acute interstitial nephritis a lot of the times. Um, the pathophysiology is a little bit complex. Heat exposure is thought to be the um, most contributing factor. So this is when they compare um, these agricultural workers to uh, agricultural workers in the same country, but at higher elevations and lower heat risk, we don't see the same rates of this disease. Um, but, you know, when you're working, you're dehydrated, you develop crystalluria, um, increased core temperature. These patients have elevated levels of CK, although not at levels of you'd see in rhabdo. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you can't really rule out other exposures, things like pesticides, toxins, and infections, which are also impacted by climate change. And this is important because CKD is a much higher cause of death in these countries. At some, some of them, it's the second leading cause of death. And when you compare mortality rates in CKD between El Salvador and the United States, El Salvador's mortality rate from CKD is 10 times higher um, here. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into that, and I'm not going to really talk about, but again, it goes to access to care. It goes to exposures. Um, you know, sometimes on rounds I've thought where, you know, I haven't had water and maybe I'm developing like numerous AKIs and I wondered um, <laughs> what my um, CKD risk is going to be in the future, but it's nothing compared to people who are working out in the sun and heat. The next big exposure is air pollution. Um, and this, you know, is very pertinent um, today, but more than 100 million people in the United States don't live in communities with adequate, um, where, where air pollution exceeds, you know, uh, air quality standards. And air quality, um, when we think about pollution, we're thinking about 
really three things. One is ozone or other volatile organic, organic compounds. You know, ground level ozone is associated with premature death, hospitalizations, a whole lot of bad things. Um, a 10 parts per billion increase in ozone from last week will increase cardiovascular mortality in the general population by half a percent. So when you're talking about millions of people, that's a lot of people. Particulate matter is important, namely um, this is coming from wildfires. Um, you know, climate, we're, we're getting drier, hotter, longer wildfire seasons. Um, and then finally, airborne allergens. As the growing season changes, we're exposed to allergens longer, more intensely, um, changes in precipitation, springs happening earlier, all these things, and that's gonna increase the risk of allergic disease and asthma. So I'm gonna talk about wildfires because that's um, something that's um, important to me personally. Um, they're not only becoming more frequent, but more acres are burned compared to just 50 years ago. And you can see the trend of this graph. It's just nicely going up and up and up. Um, the peak of wildfire season has changed from August to July. Um, and we're not only seeing displacement due to wildfires, you saw in California within the last couple of years, um, but we're also uh, seeing the consequences of its air pollution. Um, it's the particulate matter from wildfires is the leading cause of uh, short-term air pollution um, in the nation. And just a fun fact, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles and in my lifetime, I've had more smoke days than snow days. So there are times where they would not let us go outside during PE when I was in school because there was literal ash on the ground. And, you know, I'm just thinking about you know, if they didn't have these policies, I would have been outside running around, taking huge deep breaths, exposing my lungs. Um, and needless to say, not only do you have respiratory complications, you also have cardiovascular complications. So when you're exposed to fine particulate matter, that's two and a half micrometers or less, um, you have an increase in hospitalizations uh, in respiratory asthma and cardiovascular disease. This happens on smoke days and non-smoke days because uh, wildfire is not the only source of fine particulate matter. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about this article is that it's a little bit controversial in the methods of measuring fine particulate matter. And so this kind of went through a couple of those, which is a little bit too technical for this talk, but um, it, it, air pollution is bad, is the moral of the story. Um, today's pretty relevant because Canada is on fire. Quebec is uh, pretty much um, is experiencing its worst fire it's had in a very long time. Um, if you've looked at the actual trajectory of all the smoke from Canada, it's pretty much covering half the United States, including St. Louis. We have an uh, air quality alert today. Um, these are some pictures. This is Brooklyn from yesterday, and it like just keeps getting worse. I don't even know what I'm looking at here. Um, this is Canada. And then there are people who are exercising on a roof outside in smoke right now. And um, this is very interesting to me because you know people are trying to be well and exercise, not realizing that when you're doing yoga, you're taking huge, deep breaths in and out. You're exercising. You're exposing your lungs to all of these um, pollutants. But we do have this, this guy in DC who is at least wearing an N95. And luckily, people and at least the general population is a little bit more experienced with wearing masks given COVID. So I wonder if someone's eventually going to do some research to see if there are changes in health outcomes based on if people wore a mask post COVID. Now, besides heat, um, we got to think about flooding and extreme uh, weather events. So floods and power outages are pretty intimately connected. And um, they're actually, in, uh, they do lead to increased hospitalizations at a certain point. So when about 1.7% of customers are affected, which is the 75th percentile, which when you think about it is not that much, um, you have an increased risk of hospitalizations for cardiovascular disease um, on lag day three. Uh, you have an increased risk of respiratory infections on lag day six. So those are, you know, half a week to a week out. Um, but on days of these floods, you have increased risk of exacerbations of chronic respiratory diseases and food and waterborne diseases. And you can see that here. These lines just uh, represent the different lag days, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is the 75th percentile where a little bit less than 2% of people are affected by power outages. Um, and you see this sharp increase in the risk of um, 
uh, hospitalizations. Now, there's an interesting association with hurricanes and cardiovascular disease. So Hurricane Katrina um, was pretty terrible. Um, it increased the rates of primary cardiovascular uh, hospitalizations and disproportionately affected Black people um, more than white people. Um, it's it's um, interesting because it really depended on which parish you were in. So in Orleans, uh, hospitalizations peaked on the sixth day, and it, it pretty much increased the rate from about seven to eight, uh, 18 patients per 10,000 um, per day. And these were all patients above 65 years old. Um, in this chart, it, it's a little bit, um, it almost looks like a EKG with artifacts. Um, but <laughs> anyway, there are six time points here. The important time points to know is that T3, um, your, which is right here, this is Katrina landfall. T4, which is a little bit over, is the first week after Katrina, T5, uh, T, uh, 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 moving one over, it's the first month after, and then moving one over, it's the second month after. So you can see this really sharp rise in hospitalizations pretty much immediately, but it took two months to get back to normal. So you're still seeing consequences of Hurricane Katrina and cardiovascular hospitalizations two months out. And this makes sense, but it's good to have data for this. Now, when we look at Hurricane Sandy, um, it's also interesting because it was associated with an increased incidence in MI and stroke and even 30-day uh, mortality from MI, um, in increased the risk of uh, MI incidence by 22%. And that's interesting because MI is a very like chronic, it's interesting to think about the exact mechanisms, but when you're thinking about stress from these uh, extreme weather events, when you're thinking about um, not taking medicines, all this compounded, it starts to kind of unravel about why this could affect um, cardiovascular disease. Um, now, we had a flash flood in July, um, and we saw more rain in a day than any other day in history. Um, it caused two deaths, and we don't really have a whole lot of data yet on the hospitalizations, but I'm sure it's coming out. To give you some idea of what we got, we got 7.68 inches of rain in six hours and 25% of our annual rainfall in 12 hours. Our infrastructure is not capable of handling that. And we saw that. My immediate concern was when I was at the VA and I saw this rain, I wanted to get people home and safe because I saw these streets just literally flooding, cars abandoned. And I started thinking, that's directly impacting our healthcare system. Are we equipped to handle these floods? And that's something that we have to think about as an institution. Um, when we're thinking about uh, 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 water, primarily we're thinking about infection. Um, but just as we struggled with the infrastructure of our um, water management system, other, other areas have the same issues. And that really increases the risk of bacterial sewage overflow um, increased water temperatures is going to alter geographic range of waterborne pathogens. And then even increases in ambient temperature is going to increase your risk of bacterial diarrhea. And if you recall earlier, that's one of the leading causes of the increase in deaths that the uh, WHO um, predicts. Now, this is a map of uh, our wonderful 80s Egypti mosquito. Um, and in 2019, you can um, basically see uh, how many months this mosquito is active. Um, red is all the time, uh, blue is not all the time. So it's based on months. And if we fast forward to 2080, um, the entire globe kind of just starts lighting up. So you can see uh, this can increase our risk for things like dengue, yellow fever, you know, this is still not even talking about ticks where, you know, Lyme disease, you know, maybe we're going to start seeing Lyme disease in, in Missouri more often. But these are things that we have to start um, considering. And if you've heard on the news about mosquitoes who have no reproductive capability, things like that, those are all based on some policy decisions that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, a main issue is food security. So the National Science and Technology Council and the U.S. Global Change Research Program is a governmental organization. Um, they put out a report on climate change, global food security, and the U.S. food system. 
Um, and they, uh, one of the big policy endeavors of the United States is to determine these vulnerability assessments. So there are about a billion people who are undernourished right now. It's actually dropped compared to 1990, which is encouraging. Um, and uh, one thing that they noted is that food insecurity decreases GDP by about 10%. So when we think about food security, there, there, there are four pillars. There's availability, which is um, you know just do you have food in a particular place? There's access, which is the ability of someone to obtain that food. And then there's utilization. So can you utilize the food that you actually obtain? And then there's stability. So how um, likely is the situation now uh, where you're able to obtain food going to be in a couple months? So a couple of things that can impact this. Extreme weather can result in crop destruction. We already talked about um, half of Missouri's crop being destroyed um, in 1980. Um, we have reduced pollinators. Uh, it's really wonderful seeing on social media how there are people who are trying to save the bees, and these aren't the only pollinators, but I think that there's a growing understanding that the only way we get certain foods is by uh, having other uh, living organisms uh, help us obtain that food, because without them, we're not going to get a lot of our fruits and vegetables. And then another thing is inability to maintain livestock. We also need to feed them. So if we're already having our own food insecurities, how are we supposed to support animals? Um, access, so income, climate change will infect, uh, uh, affect economics um, and uh, lower income, lower ability to uh, buy food. Utilization, so interestingly, the increase in CO2 is actually directly correlated with decrease in some micronutrients in, in food. So things like iron, zinc um, and uh, proteins. So not even talking about food destruction, just physically there's more CO2 in our system and that's causing decreased um, uh, nutrient density. Um, another thing is foodborne illness. So a lot of these are bacterial diarrheas like increased rates of salmonella, campylobacter, vibrio. And then finally, um, uh, with instability, climate change is really gonna increase costs for a myriad of ways. Um, increased cost to uh, irrigate soils, you know, loss of crop is going to increase the demand and increase costs, um, a lot of consequences of capitalism. Now, a couple articles have really talked about this, um, Missouri specific. So this article interviewed a farmer near Kansas City. His name is Josh Payne. He's a seventh generation farmer near Kansas City. He has a um, 300 acre uh, farm and grows specialty crops livestock and um uh it was just chronicling his worry about you know their their floods and i can't plant grazing crops for my animals so what do i need to do uh how do i you know it's going to cost him about a hundred thousand dollars per year in some of these wet uh years so in 2019 a million acres in missouri were non-plantable that's a lot of acres because the soil was just too wet um in 2022 the drought was so bad that uh, it affected the Missouri and Mississippi River so much that we saw our like local shipwrecks and the barge system actually just is, which is an important economic um, component of our uh, 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 city um, was negatively impacted. So the EPA actually put this together specifically for Missouri and uh, essentially says that um, Missouri is gonna have increase in annual precipitation, increased flooding from the Missouri and um, uh, Mississippi rivers, reduction in livestock due to heat, and then increases in ground level ozone. And that's gonna affect our crops because those actually decrease the yields of like soybeans and, and wheat. Um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that barge system, if you wanna put a number to it, it costs Missouri almost $300 million. That's not an insignificant amount of money for our city. Um, Another important consequence of climate change we have to think about is displacement, and these are climate refugees. You know, with extreme weather and inability to um, grow crops, um, uh, inadequate water, people are gonna be pushed out. It's estimated that about 143 million people from Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America are gonna be climate refugees. And the European Union uh, assumes that there's gonna be a 28% in just climate refugees by 2100. So how do we fix this? Well, I don't have the exact answer. No one is going to have the exact answer. 
but there are some organizations like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that recommends that to avoid catastrophe, we need to limit our increase in temperature by one and a half degrees centigrade. The way to do this is by research, policy, and education. So one thing I noticed is that a lot of our specialty societies have put out statements um, about climate change uh, and health impacts directly to their specialty. So ESC had one, AHA had one. Um, if you look at your specific society, you should read about what impacts are affecting your patients. The University of California actually has a Center for Climate Health and Equity. Um, this is led by Ariane Tehrani and Sherry Weiser. Um, and then WashU, WashU also has their own um, climate uh, research program. Um, and there's some works on uh, uh, health impacts as well. Um, education, I saw this on the New England Journal of Medicine. It's an interactive um, uh, module where you can look and see exactly what kind of health effects you can have from climate change. And it'll link all the New England Journal of Paper. So you can look if you're curious about what kind of infections, click on it it'll link you to the papers. It's a really nice, convenient way to consolidate a lot of this information. Another um, governmental organization is the Fourth National Climate Assessment. There, they are mandated um, to provide Congress and the president um, effects of global change on the environment and health. And I got a lot of my information from this um, reading. So if you're interested in it, it's like 16 chapters, but um, it goes for, it, it, it talks about all the climate uh, related uh, complications. I won't go into it too much, but the CDC has something called BRACE, which is just a five-step process framework on how to assess climate complications and how to uh, uh, combat the effects. So, you know, first thing is anticipating climate impacts and vulnerabilities, projecting the disease burden, what public health interventions do we have, develop and implement a plan, and then evaluate. Very similar to some of our own action plans that we have, but it's nice that the government thinks this is an important thing to think about, and hopefully it'll inspire other, um, even hospital organizations and institutions to work on this. And even the DHHS has a climate action plan. Um, uh, that's a big document, but if you're interested, I'd recommend you um, looking at it. So just a couple concluding thoughts. Climate change is already here, it's happening, and we're already experiencing its health effects. You know, actionable policies shouldn't only aim to decrease our contribution to climate change, but also addressing the climate gap in some of these vulnerable uh, populations. And finally, it, this is not going to happen unless we actually philosophically decide that we're going to invest in future generations. We're going to probably see worsening climate impacts. And a lot of the curves that you see is that it peaks towards the end of our lifetimes and can drop off if we actually make the right decision. So maybe in our lifetimes, we won't see um, reversal of a lot of this stuff, but that's why we have to think hard about what we want as a society and and think about 100 years from now. Um, but th that's the conclusion of my talk. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. I hope you thought it was really interesting. I just really want to thank the house staff, my co-chiefs, um, Dr. Chang, um, Dr. Costco, and Dr. Frazier. It's been a real pleasure to work with you this year. And then for your credit, here are the weird boxes. Thank you for that. That was a terrific talk, although really depressing, but important. So we have time for a few questions. Please, maybe I'll start. So do, given your reading and expertise in the area now, do you have uh, thoughts about what individual um, changes people could start focusing on just to take it a step at a time? Yeah. A yeah. So there are a lot of local changes and they actually kind of coincide with things I'm passionate about. So one of the big things I was reading about is urban farming. So I like gardening a lot, but one of the things is that agriculture contributes maybe up to 30% of our um, contributions to uh, greenhouse gases. And Think of it, you know, you're using energy to grow plants and then you're transporting it all over the United States. Should I be able to buy an avocado that's grown in Mexico? Maybe, maybe not. That's something that we have to think about. Um, and one of the things about urban farming is that it, it increases food security for local populations. It increases wellness, physical activity, and then it decreases transportation, energy costs, and economic costs and can actually um, decrease cost of food. So 
I try to buy local. I try to not use a whole lot of plastics, which uses a lot of um, petroleum products and, you know, the, which also contribute to climate change. And, you know, it's not on you to change the climate, but it is on you to make right decisions and encourage other people to make right decisions because the only way this works is, is by changing our practices and habits. Great, thanks. Other questions? Yeah, Julia, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it.